Hello and welcome to Module 2. We're going to be talking a little bit about how cameras work, but really about exposure. That's kind of the whole idea of what we're getting at here. We want to learn how to take pictures and have them be bright enough. <laughs> that's, that's a gross simplification. Um, photography is about a lot more than just getting pictures that are not too bright and not too dark, but that is an important skill. Uh, before we get to composition and before we get to styling and props and any of that kind of stuff, we just need to take pictures that turn out as bright or as dark as we want them to be. It's subjective. We can choose to make them bright or dark. They can be high key or low key, um, you know, or they can be neutral, whatever. But we want to understand how it works. Now, um, understanding how light works is a critical component of understanding how to make a proper exposure. And so we're going to talk a little about that and about the camera settings and controls that affect our exposure. Now, the word exposure, just to clarify, as I say that repeatedly throughout this lecture, it's going to be used in probably a couple of different ways, and we'll see if I can remember to point them out as we go. But when we talk about an exposure, that can mean a number of different things. Taking a photograph is equal to making an exposure uh, in photographer speak. And so if I say that's a great exposure, I might be referring to that being a nice picture or the brightness levels in that picture are nice. It could mean either thing. <laughs> so it depends kind of on context. Um, and so that likewise, the second meaning of that, the exposure is referring to the brightness of the image. Is it overexposed? Is it underexposed? Is it too bright or too dark? So uh, changing the exposure may mean changing the aperture or the ISO or other camera settings. And so we'll talk about those as we go along. But the purpose of your camera is to convert analog information, meaning light traveling through the air and through whatever, to reach our camera sensor. How do we control how much light gets through our camera lens? And, and that's really what it comes down to because the sensor, as we discussed a little bit before, is where that light gets converted into digital information. So the camera is just simply digitizing um, light. We take a certain quantity of light and that equates to a certain brightness level in our picture. Okay, so whether that's with a film camera, digital camera, the idea is the same. The camera is simply an instrument that controls how much light gets to your film or your sensor. The two main controls that do that is the aperture and the shutter. And then ISO plays a role in the exposure overall as well, too, but we'll get to that. All right, so light, I think most of you have probably taken, at least in uh, junior high school, some sort of physics where you learn about light. But as a review, we'll talk about a couple of things here. So light is energy, simply put, it's energy. It's electromagnetic radiation, actually. Um, and so light... What we consider light is typically more specifically referred to as visible light. Um, there is also other forms. There's infrared, ultraviolet. Those are not visible light to us, but it's the exact same energy. It's also electromagnetic radiation. We just don't have cells in our eyes that can pick it up. We can't distinguish it. Um, if we were to go further with that, then radio waves, microwaves, um, shortwave, uh, x-rays, lots of these other kinds of things, those are also light. They're just not visible light, not to us. There are devices that can sense it, for example, an x-ray machine, uh, but it's light. It's all the same kind of thing. Works the same way. It's energy. And some wavelengths of light have more energy than others. If you think about parking a white car out in a parking lot in the sun on a hot summer Arizona day next to a black car, with a black paint job, one of those is going to get a whole lot hotter, right? Um, partly that has to do with because of how that energy in the light gets converted to heat. On a white car, a lot of that light reflects, and so it gets less hot. On a black car, a lot of that light gets absorbed, and it doesn't disappear. That energy has to go somewhere, so it gets converted to thermal energy. Anyway, so let's keep going. Let's talk about the camera part of this anyway, because that's really what it is. There's another class called GIT 295 where we can learn a lot more about light, but um, that's not for today. Um, what we're concerned with is how light gets through your camera's lens and onto the sensor or the focal plane. So this diagram that you see here shows a cross-section view illustration of a camera. So you've got this little snail on the right-hand side. 
light from the sun or whatever light source you have is kind of bouncing off of your subject and it's reflecting off the different materials, the different colors, the different angles and, and surfaces of that object. And it's bouncing in every different direction. And part of that light is bouncing into your camera lens. Now the diameter of the lens or the width of the lens here is going to affect how much light can come through. So some lenses can absorb more light, some less. But that's not really critical. What is critical con controlling how much light makes it through there in part is a thing called the aperture. And I don't have a pointer to show you right now and my mouse doesn't show up on this recording software. So you just have a look in the center of the lens. You see that black rectangle. It might be kind of small to see. There's an opening in that and it's the same in the camera lens. There's an opening inside of the camera lens. So in between all the glass that makes up the lens itself, there's a small opening and it's called the aperture. And anybody who plays uh, old video games like Portal, for example, you've seen the Aperture logo. If not, look it up. <laughs> but it's a device that is built to increase its width or decrease its width. You can control how large or how small that aperture is. It's an opening that's variable. And so by adjusting the size of that variable opening, we can control, in part, how much light makes it back to the sensor back there. Okay. So let's keep going a little bit here. Terminology again, we talked about this before, but overexposed means there's too much light, underexposed, too little light. So we can uh, adjust our camera settings to let in more light if we need or to block out some light if we need to. If we're out taking pictures on a bright sunny day uh, on the mountains in the snow and there's light coming from above, there's light reflecting off the snow, it's going to be super, super bright. We're going to, need to block out some of that light using our aperture and shutter speed. Underexposed, there's too little light. Same thing. We can control that. We can open the aperture up wider and let more light in. And we can have the shutter stay open longer. But let's take a look. Um, every camera has an aperture control, sorry, and a shutter control. Manual cameras. Cameras that have manual settings do anyhow. Uh, your cell phone may not have controls over those kind of things. Um, but it does have an aperture and it does have a shutter. Um, whether you can access that and control it or not is a different matter. But um, for your assignment, you're going to have a chance to think over that a bit. But here's some examples of some random, you know, overexposed images. It's easy to tell that they're overexposed. Here's some photos that are underexposed. Same thing. Easy to tell. They're a little bit too dark. Now, again, just to point out that you can choose to make an image bright or dark as a creative option, the way that you want the photo to look can be like bright or dark. However, there's a certain point, like in these overexposed images, where you simply don't have any detail left. If you look at the dog, on the dog's face, on the bright part of his, uh, his nose, you see that it's just solid white. In the background and part of his ear, it's solid white. There's no detail there whatsoever. So this is beyond overexposed. These are just random pictures from the internet, but they demonstrate what happens a lot of time. Picture is totally overexposed, not going to do just much good. And you can't recover that. Some of these images that are pretty dark, if you look at the right hand side of that woman's face, it's totally underexposed to the point where there's no detail there anymore. And so our goal with controlling our exposure is not to make images bright or dark. It's to use the camera as an instrument that can capture as much data as possible. And then we can choose how we want that to look as well. All right, so the things that control the light coming in, we talked about this before, the aperture, it controls the diameter of the opening inside of the lens. So think of uh, your lens on your camera as kind of a, well, you saw the diagram. We won't talk more about that. We'll come back to uh, shutter after this, so let's move on. Um, on a video camera, it's called an iris. So if you're more familiar with that term, iris and aperture are the exact same thing. Um, if you look in the mirror at your pupil, you see that your pupil, and you guys know that it, your, you know, if it gets brighter or darker, your pupil is going to increase or decrease. That's your iris opening up and closing down. Same purpose as a camera. It's going to control how much light's coming into your eyes, depending on how bright or how dark it is. Here's a, a little old graphic demonstrating kind of what that aperture might look like inside of a camera. And there's some numbers that go along with the aperture settings. Um, these are called f-stops. 
So the f stop is the setting or the number that describes the, the diameter of the opening inside of the, the camera lens, the aperture. So f16, big number, small opening. f5, kind of a medium number, <laughs> medium opening. f2.8, small number, large opening. So this may be counterintuitive, but when you're trying to learn and, and get familiar with it, it may be confusing sometimes that a large number is a small opening. It's just how it is, okay? If it helps to think of it like a fraction, you know, f1 over 16, you know, 1 16th is much smaller than 1 over 2.8. You know, if you think in terms of fractions, that may help make sense. Uh, we won't get into too much of it. It's a ratio based on how long the lens is and other things, but... Uh, Anyway, just remember that a big number is a small aperture, and a, a, a small number is a, a wide or large aperture. So if it's dark and we need to let more light in, we're going to choose a low number for our aperture, like f2.8. It's going to let more light come in through the lens. Um, here's another graphic just kind of showing the same thing. f1.0 is very large, f1.4, less 2.0, less 2.8, less, and a 4, and so on. Um, what's happening is this: these values, um, we're not going to quiz you on exactly what they are or what they mean, but be familiar with the fact that notice a 1.0 and a 1.4, the number isn't like half as much as the other or double the other. But what it is doing is it's controlling half as much or double the amount of light that comes through. So if we go from F1 to F1.4, we are reducing the amount of light that can make it to the sensor by one half. If we go from 1.4 to f2, we're reducing the amount of light by one half. And likewise, if we go the other way, for example, from f4 to f2.8, we're doubling the amount of light that can come in. Okay, so that may be uh, something you have to think about for a little while, but that's that's the an important concept to remember with f stops or later on we'll talk about stops in general is that they are double or half the amount of light depending on if we're going up or down all right shutter is another control on the camera it's a setting that we can choose to affect how much light's coming in but instead of an opening that is variable in size shutter is just a curtain that sits in front of your sensor and it's going to either be open or shut that's it. It's only kind of got those two states. But it can be open or shut for a certain amount of time. And the duration that that shutter is open for is going to control how long light's coming in. Whereas the aperture controls how much light comes in at any given time, the shutter controls how long or the duration of light coming in through there. So between the aperture and shutter, you have really fine control over how much light is making it through to the sensor. All right. And I'll post a video in Slack that shows you um, what I mean with that. And you can see exactly how a camera shutter works. All right. Now, the heading on the top of this slide says a reciprocal relationship. Um, the term reciprocity has to do with that relationship between the shutter and the aperture. If we want to have a brighter picture, we can take a our aperture we can increase it we can go with a wider aperture so for example let's say our camera is at f8 and it's way too dark we can go to f2.8 and let in a whole lot more light maybe we also need to go with a longer shutter speed because it's still too dark where we're taking that picture and so we go from a shutter speed of something like uh, two hundredth of a second which that shutter would open and then close again in two hundredth of a second very short time we can change that to say like 20th of a second. 1 20th of a second is a much longer amount of time to let light in for. Now, reciprocity has to do with the fact that when we change one, it's going to affect the other. So sometimes we want to use a long shutter speed. For example, let's say you're taking a picture of a waterfall and you want the water to be a blurry and smooth. Um, you need a long shutter speed so that that picture take, it, you know, your camera is exposed to, to that light coming from the waterfall for a longer period of time. It's going to give you some motion blur. And so in order to do that longer shutter speed, it's going to be letting in more and more light and your picture is going to start to get overexposed. So to compensate for that or to reciprocate, 
you would need to close the aperture down, make the aperture smaller to let less light in to compensate for the increased light coming in from the shutter. Okay, um, you can read this slide. I'll pause for a second and let you just read it. I don't want to read all this, all the thing to you. I think I explained it on the last side, but there is kind of a little formula there. Intensity times time equals exposure. So intensity, we can say, is your aperture, and time is your shutter. So the duration of time that light's coming in uh, times the intensity of light that's coming in, meaning how wide that aperture is, how much or volume of light is coming in at any given time, that's going to result in your exposure. And so just like a math equation, if you want to balance that out, a change to one, you're going to change the other accordingly. Okay. All right. Now, this one, I hesitate to show this because it can be misleading. The top apertures or f-stops and the shutter speeds on the bottom, those don't correlate with each other at all. This is just showing you kind of what they are. So f1 and 1 second, those don't have anything to do with each other necessarily. Um, this is just showing what some shutter speeds are and what some apertures are. Now, the apertures on, on modern cameras, you have um, some settings in between that don't show here. So, for example, if you look over at... Uh, f5.6 and f8 and f11 and f16 like those are set values 5.6 8 11 16 those are actual f stops that come from um, the ratio from the focal length to the aperture opening and so on uh, they go back to like film cameras most digital cameras now they can also go in between like one third f stops so you may have like uh, f13 uh, in between f11 and f16 and you have some other options uh, so these are like the traditional full f-stops the shutter speeds same thing some cameras may have other options here so like you have 1 50th of a second on some cameras 1 45th of a second and so on but these are shutter speeds that are going to be uh, you know controlling different things and so just so you know there are different values and some cameras can go to like 1 20 thousandth of a second shutter speed have a very very short exposure and some photos can be taken over a period of minutes rather than just uh, fractions of a second so you have very long exposures all right now so we're going to talk about iso and iso is kind of the third uh third part of our exposure triangle that exposure triangle concept is something that you may hear or find if you look online about this um think of uh seesaw or teeter-totter or you know whatever you call that based on the region you grew up in but you've got a teeter-totter or a seesaw and the more weight you put on one it's going to raise the other side up so that kind of think of that concept of a scalar balance as is what we're doing with our shutter and our aperture you know if one changes it's going to have an effect on the other side iso adds a third section to that teeter-totter which can kind of complicate things but what it does is it is not control how much light comes in so it's not doing the same thing as shutter or aperture it doesn't have anything to do with how much light is coming into your camera the only thing that iso does is it takes whatever light your camera has already recorded and it amplifies that digitally so think of um if, if you any of you have any experience with like audio production or anything recording um boosting the gain uh increasing the volume whatever amplifying the signal is going to result in a louder audio signal but it's also going to re result in increased noise because the camera is not recording any more light there's not any more data actually being recorded what's happening when you increase the iso is you are getting you're taking what little bit of data is there and digitally amplifying that you're boosting the signal and it's going to result in some of the image information that's already there is going to look brighter but in addition you're going to get a lot of, um, you know, interference, digital noise. It's going to look bad in your image. So rule of thumb is keep your ISO as low as possible for the conditions that you're shooting in. In a photo studio where it's never too dark because we can always just add more lights or increase the power of our lights, the ISO is always going to stay really low, you know, 100, 200 ISO. If you're shooting live events, for example, sports at night, uh, concerts, things like that, where you don't have control of the lighting conditions, 
you may need to increase the ISO pretty high just to get the photo. So context, it's going to just depend on, on what you're doing, uh, what that ISO needs to be. But general rule of thumb is get the ISO and the shutter speed, what you need to get um, to control motion blur, depth of field, and some other things. But the ISO is kind of your last resort. Increase that as needed, but just know that the higher you go on the ISO, the more grain and the worse image quality you're going to get. Um, modern cameras do much, much better with this. So talking about CCDs and CMOS sensors like you did before, um, you know, modern sensors, my camera, I have a nice camera that's going to be able to shoot high ISOs, 1200 ISO with very little problem, you know, whereas my first digital camera that I had, if I went to 1200 ISO, the image would be completely unusable. So that technology is advancing more and more and more and even modern cell phones uh, the new iphones new, new google phones and things like that are going to have extremely good noise performance so higher iso is becoming less of a problem but still if you can control it you know it's something that you just need to be familiar with what are the boundaries where your camera is going to have an acceptable iso level and and what should you avoid all right so Going on a little bit further, here's just another sample showing you on whatever random picture these sample images were from. 100, 200, 400, 800. I would call those ISO values on that particular camera. Those are all pretty acceptable. Uh, some of the grain and noise is just from the you know JPEG saving of this image in PowerPoint. But you get into the 16, 32, 6400, uh, 12,800. And the noise or grain in those images gets pretty nasty. You can see it really obviously. So again, just keep the ISO as low as possible to get the good results that you need. But if you just simply don't have enough light using external light sources, using shutter speed and aperture, then ISO is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to amplify that. You're going to have to boost the signal. All right, so here's an example of how the uh, brightness in the resulting image is affected by the ISO. Um, in this case, 100. 320 800 ISO is going to make the image get progressively brighter. Um, just know that if, if we were pixel peeping on this image and, and really looking close at a high quality, high res version of that without the JPEG artifacts, then you would start to see some noise coming in there. Whether that matters is all dependent on the situation that you're photographing. All right, let's move along. So, metering this is something important to know. Um, a meter can be a number of different things. Let's Let's, uh, I don't know how much we want to talk about these bullet points, but camera manufacturers, engineers, designing camera sensors and things, um, and photographers in general over decades and centuries at this point have determined that, uh, you know, an average ideal scenario, uh, if we were to take a photograph that is properly exposed and maybe bring that into Photoshop and just blur everything until there's no detail left, it would be at about an 18% gray. Get rid of the color too. Um, whether that's realistic for every scenario or not is, is you know, obviously not the case. But on average, 18% gray is probably a decent brightness value to shoot for. And so these engineers and, and uh, camera manufacturers have built in uh, that value as what your camera is looking for to choose the proper exposure. Modern digital cameras are much more sophisticated in choosing that. So I'm kind of simplifying things a little bit. But if I were to point my camera at a wall, blank wall, and just set on auto and take a picture, I could bring it into Photoshop and, and get about an 18% gray if I threw away all the color and just blurred everything. Um, the way that your camera does that, though, how it knows what settings to choose on auto is it uses what's called a meter. So a light meter there's two kinds. One is the one built into your camera. That's called a TTL meter or through the lens meter. The other kind of meter is a incident meter. And, and most people don't have those unless you work in a photo studio, especially in the film days of photography. And that was a handheld device that you would take and you would hold in the scene where the photo is being taken. It's not part of your camera at all. You'd press a button on that meter, that device, and it's going to read the amount of light in that scene and tell you what settings to use. And you'd walk back over to your camera and you set the aperture and the shutter speed 
to the values that that meter told you would give you the brightness value that you needed because that meter is looking at how bright how much light there is in that place where you held the meter so the ttl meter is what we're going to talk about here um, through the lens meaning light comes through the lens and it's a second sensor your camera actually has two sensors one for recording the photo but the other sensor is for the meter it doesn't actually look at detail or anything all it does is look at how bright things are or how dark things are there's different kinds and let me see if i, I think i have maybe i don't i thought i had some graphics in here that show up but what it does is it looks at the scene and evaluates how bright it is and there can be a matrix meter that looks at like a grid of the whole photo and kind of looks at each cell and then averages them out. You can have a spot meter, which is looking at just a single point in that scene. Um, so for example, let's say that I want to take a picture of a, a crow, a raven, a blackbird, uh, but it's sitting on a, a white, you know, structure or whatever. If I average the entire scene out for all that white background or bright sky or whatever, then the bird itself is just going to turn into a silhouette. It'll be too dark. So that would be a case where I might use a spot meter and place that spot meter. I'm looking through the camera. I'm looking through the camera lens and there's a little spot in the center. Put that spot meter over the bird and then the camera's auto settings will be adjusted to, to the bird, to the black bird, to the crow or whatever. And then everything else will probably be way too bright, but you know, that's how you choose what it is that you want to expose. Um, those meters are you know every camera has those whether you can control them or not depends if you've ever taken your cell phone to take a picture and it looks too bright or too dark and so you tap on a part of it and it adjusts that's what's happening is you're just telling your camera your cell phone where to meter so if you're taking a picture of something it usually on your phone you do that more often to focus but most phones will do that too to adjust the brightness based on the area you tell at least mine will <laughs> so i'm going to give that a try but anyway that's what a meter is so just be aware um, that's an important thing to understand and the difference between a meter uh, in your camera the ttl meter and an incident meter is a big difference one is uh, every camera has it and you can change between matrix weighted center spot so on um, or you have that handheld device that you put out into a scene um, the camera's TTL meter, just as a note to be aware of, is going to be absolutely useless to you in a photo studio with strobes. Because, think about this, when we're taking a picture uh, with a meter through the lens, it's looking at the scene through the lens prior to when you press the shutter button. As soon as you press the shutter button, you're locked in, you're taking the photo based on those meter readings. Now, the thing in the studio is that when you press the shutter, that's what triggers the strobes or the flashes to fire. And so when the flashes go off, there's a totally different amount of light in the scene than there was when that TTL meter was looking at that a fraction of a second before you press the shutter. So it's always going to be completely wrong to use your camera's TTL meter in a studio. So if a meter is going to be used in a photo studio, it'll be a TTL, I'm sorry, <laughs> it'll be an incident meter where you can hand hold that. You put it in the scene, you fire the strobes, and the meter will look at the brightness of all that light, and then you just walk over to the camera and plug in those values on the shutter and the aperture, and you're good to go. Uh, 